and welcome to another At History Gems, and today, the Hundred Years' War in five minutes. Okay, right up front, I'm going to be honest, I don't agree with the term Hundred Years' War. It was invented many centuries later to describe a period of fighting between the English crown and the French crown. However, we're talking about the period of roughly... 1337 to 1453, and somewhat implies that France and England hadn't been fighting before that. They had for hundreds of years. And also, of course, they continued to fight after this period for hundreds of years. What you can see here is a map of France. The purpley bits are basically either English or rebel-held. The green are French king-held. And you can see the problem. So you can see that basically the King of England had had lands in France for centuries. And really what this fight was about was in 1337, King Edward III, King of England, said, do you know what, because of my lineage, I'm now King of France. And this was because the previous King of France hadn't had any sons. But this was news to the new King of France, who had a similar lineage to Edward. Now, in 1340, we get the first major battle. It's not one you've probably heard of, the Battle of Sluis. And that was basically when the English Navy came in and destroyed the French Navy. It's important because from that point onwards, we never really see a threat of France invading England. It's pretty much always the other way round. More famously, in 1346, you get the Battle of Crecy, where the English longbowmen and Welsh ones, I should mention that too, annihilate uh, the French forces. But it's in 1347, the year later, that's slightly more important in the long term, because that's when Edward captures Calais. Calais is an English town until the time of Henry VIII. A year after that, 1348, you get the Black Death. And actually, the reason why I have such an issue with this being the Hundred Years' War is there are periods of, of big times of peace. 1360 to 1369, no wars. Uh, from about uh, 1389, nearly got there, to 1415, that's 25 years' worth, more peace. So there are big chunks where there's no fighting going on. Now, the 1415 period is where we get the next legend of this story. Henry V started with the Siege of Harfleur and successfully captured it, but it's the Battle of Agincourt he's, of course, legendarily remembered for. Basically, what it boils down to is the French have been losing so badly for so long that they needed to stop this. And as the French king was mad, Charles VI, how mad, you ask? Well, he had a habit of staying in bed because he thought he was made of glass and might shatter, that they decided to pick a winner and say that Henry V could become King of France when Charles died. Unfortunately, Henry died just a few weeks before Charles did, and that led to a new succession dispute. The new Dauphin of France decided to raise armies and keep fighting against the baby Henry VI. And it's a few years into this that we then get the next legend, Joan of Arc. I have to be honest about Joan of Arc. I think she's a very sad story. But like a lot of these legends, she was eventually turned into a saint. A lot of it's been exaggerated. Undeniably, during this period in the late 1420s, we see a resurgence of France. Unsurprising. England had been on top for so long, it actually had smaller armies, less resources, so eventually at some point France was going to make a comeback. It just so happened, it happened at the time of Joan, but if you look at the battle she was involved in, undeniably we have the relief of Orléans, and we have the Battle of Pâté, which the French remember very famously, but it wasn't really her who was doing most of the fighting or, or rallying, if you like. There was a famous French general called La Hire who has sort of suffered because everything's about Joan. Joan was eventually, of course, captured, but she was captured by the French, Burgundian rebels, not by the English, and handed over to the English. And it's at this point the English put her on trial for heresy and she's burnt at the stake. Now, you can criticise the English for doing this, but you're going to get rid of enemy generals, really. And as she didn't, she wasn't rich, she didn't have any money to have a ransom. Who should be criticised is the Dauphin. This was his general, and he did nothing to save her. Her. She's a symbol of the resurgence of France, and everybody loves a winner. But what it ultimately led to, these wars, was a clarification of France and England. Prior to this, English nobles would speak French. After these wars, they spoke English. And it was the same thing in France, not so much in terms of language, but finally we get a unified France, not with 
semi-autonomous regions warring with the king. These wars, though, devastated France. The English had a habit of burning everything they possibly could. They were called chevauches. Sounds nice, but actually they were horrible. So France had to recover after this period of war. But ironically, England didn't really take much advantage of it, because after 1453, the loss of the last few areas of Normandy to France, we now get the start of the War of the Roses in England, where basically all these veterans from France start fighting in England. There you go, over 100 years in 5 minutes. If you like that, there's always more. At History Gems can be found on Twitter and on Facebook. But of course, you can now buy The Busy Person's Guide to British History, available on Amazon, both in the US and UK. Have a good one.